Um, welcome to EduView, um, talking to trends in EdTech for you. If you want to find out more about um, the ladies of EduView, please check out our About Us page on Google+. Plus. For our sixth episode tonight, we'd like to welcome Mary Kentwell from Mount Vernon Presbyterian School. So Mary, why don't you take a few moments to introduce yourself again. <laughs> I, I, I will love to and I'll make, okay. Um, hi, I'm Mary Kentwell from Mount Vernon Presbyterian School here in Atlanta. Um, I've been at Mount Vernon for the past six years and for the last four years, I've been fortunate enough to um, work with design thinking with our students and our faculty. And um, each year has just blossomed and grown and taken on a life of its own. And I think it has enriched not only my, um, my everyday experience with our students and faculty, but as a school in general, it has opened up doors. It has put a spotlight on us in a way that we didn't expect in a very good way and we have been able to collaborate and reach out and work with people across the country and globally um, with this concept called design thinking and what that also has done though it has also been able to spotlight other aspects to our school that we have been working very hard on and um, developing and um, with our faculty and our students and in the end all this really comes down to is our students and that's why we do design thinking um, we we started with our students and then we we brought the teachers on um, into the uh, into the um, arena of experiencing design thinking in the last year or so but our four our, our students for the last four years have really been the ones that have led the charge and um, so I, I'm excited to talk more about it and, and what design thinking is and how it's how it was brought to our school but also how it has enriched our school and also built relationships such as being here on ed, ed view at Edu view, Edview, 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 Edview view. Um, I mean that wouldn't have happened, and so it, it's great that we get to um, we get to connect with people through social media and um, and go beyond design thinking, but also just again the connections I think are really the key part to this 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 story that we have to tell. Awesome. Well, we're glad to have you. Um, and we're going to have an exciting conversation tonight. Before we get started with design thinking, Kat's going to share with us a hot topic. Yes, definitely. Um, for those of you who know me, um, I am a big fan of gamification and game-based learning. I uh, am doing a lot of research in that. In fact, you know, I'm aiming to get my dissertation done, and I just finished my first year of my doctorate, and I was successful. I survived, so yay. Um, so actually, uh, a webinar that's coming up. Uh, next week, and I will tweet the link shortly, um, presented by Dr. Chris Haskell from Boise State, who will be talking about game-based curriculum, so questing, badging, um, achievements, and personalized learning. So if anybody's interested, it is Tuesday, May 4th at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and it is free. So I will tweet that link, and we'll also post it in the show notes for anybody who's interested. Awesome. Thanks for sharing. So let's jump right in. Jamie, did you have a question for Mary? Um, oh no, well, I have a hot topic. Oh, um, I'm sorry, hot topic. Don't leave me behind, Stacia. Don't leave me behind. <laughs> no, no, you guys, no, you guys have, you are left behind. Do you guys have jingles for when your hot topics comes in? Like, uh, you gotta work on that. Well, you know, we have a special guest coming up probably in the next, like, month or so, and I think he's gonna give us a lot of tips on how to, how to add some, some flair to this whole edge of you. That would add stuff. that transition thing. Uh-huh, it would, yeah. So I have a feeling that's coming. Okay. Wait for it. Wait for it. I will. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I've been doing a little commute lately. Um, you know, I spent about three-ish hours on the road um, to do this iPad pilot in Roswell. And um, I have to say tomorrow is the end of that commute. Yay. And yay for that being in the commute. But, you know, I, I really have to say it's going to be so bittersweet because I've really, I've really grown attached to a lot of these teachers. And so it's going to be bittersweet. I'm going to be thrilled I'm not commuting. Um, but I'm going to, I'm really going to miss some super, super great teachers that are, are there. But one thing I do want to say is yesterday, um, I had an honor of being able to lead a tour through the school um, with um, Hope Goldcox and Mindy Ramon, who are the instructional technology top echelon of Fulton Schools, um, and Mr. Williams from Kennesaw State University. And um, I was so excited because I got to show them, you know, all the really awesome things that are going on in those classrooms now that we've had, you know, eight weeks of, you know, intense technology integration happening. Um, and so, you know, I was, I was so pumped about, you know, the iPads were out. I had all 60 of them were in hands of some child somewhere in that building. Um, and so it was like this culmination of, yay! 
Um, but the hot topic that I want to throw out there is that one of the things I pointed out, even there was iPads galore yesterday, one of the things that I pointed out that I thought was so important, and I'd love for us to talk about this in the future, um, is when we walked into classrooms that didn't have desks, um, I, I pointed out to them that not only were there iPads in these classrooms, but there weren't desks. There were tables. They weren't rooms that were designed for this teacher-centered, look-at-me, sage-on-stage vision. Um, it was there were rooms that were designed for creative thinking, for collaboration, for for there to be many different things going on, and it was lending the, that sort of environment was lending itself to to what was going on with the iPads and the computers and the classrooms. But that environment was lending itself to it, and um, you know I, I really hope we can have conversations about that in the future because classroom organization is huge, and I'm I'm willing to bet in design thinking there's probably some classroom you know, vision that is huge in, in design thinking. So maybe that's where I'll start. Um, maybe give us a little preface, because I'm not certain that everybody watching knows exactly what is design thinking. And then what does it look like? If I walked into a room that was that was set up in, in design thinking, what would I see? Well, that's those are great questions. And I think it's a great lead in when you um, talk about the classroom environment, because typically, um, to start a design thinking challenge, typically the environment is a great jumping off point. It's a great one to jump in and get your feet wet and actually go through the experience because everyone is very familiar with what the environment they're, they're, they're living in. And so students are able to communicate it, they're able to see it, they're able to experience, and they're able to tell others what they, they need in, a, in an environment. And so with classrooms being so stagnant in their, I guess their, um, Decoration. Um, they they pretty much you could 1980s, 1970s, 1960s going back. They pretty much they look very similar, and so it's a it's a great great um, launching pad. So going with the idea of what is design thinking and and what does it look like? There's many definitions. There's many approaches, and there's many um, many ways that it, it gets implemented. And you know, it, we at Mount Vernon first learned of design thinking through Kim Sachs at New Avis School and also the D School um, um, from Stanford. And our head of school, Dr. Jacobson, brought it to our school with this idea of like, you know, you need to check out this, 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 this phrase, design thinking. Look what it is. See this teacher out in California. She talked about some story. Check the story out and then see what we can do with it. And Design thinking is a mindset. It's, it's, a, it's an approach of, of looking at, at a, a problem, but instead of going right to a solution, you first have to really understand where this problem is festering. What is, what is, what is this, how is it impacting a person? And so the way we, de we, we define it and the way I deliver it to my, my younger students is de design thinking is a human-centered problem solving. So human, I mean, people are right at the center of it. You know, when you're, you're dealing with, when you're dealing with design thinking, you're dealing with people with an emphasis of empathy. If you're able to understand where that person is, and it's not so much, oh, I'm looking for a problem, looking for a problem, you're just engaging with a person and trying to collect their stories and experiences and seeing maybe, um, as Greg Banford um, coined for me, is, is there something broken? Is there some crack in, in, in the story that maybe you could improve? So human-centered problem solving with an emphasis of empathy, creativity, and collaboration. And so, but the key of this is the empathizing. If you can't understand, and again, you have that sympathy and empathy part. You can, oh, I'm, I'm sorry for your loss. The empathy is actual, the feeling of it. And we don't, I mean, our students are, are fortunate enough that they're able to go throughout the world throughout the country and, and go on vacations and, and, and see different lifestyles and different and different ways of things but I think the idea of actually knowing what your neighbors experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis or even a, 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 a local community member and understanding you know why this person might be having a bad day and stopping and really listening to their feelings that's the key with design thinking um, typically um, and I, I say this also is we're, we're all natural problem solvers you have a problem, I can fix it. Like, for example, our Google Hangout when you when it was you know having some glitches. What about this? What about that? What about this? Can we fix it here? Can we plug this in? We were going right to the solution. 
Well, with design thinking, you don't do that. You wait. You pause. You actually sit back and you let things come to you, and and you 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 get to that middle part that people tend to like to want to skip because the middle part's messy. It takes time, and if you can apply design thinking, say in your your career, your um your your workplace, it takes a lot of time to look at the things that maybe are broken. But in the end, the, the solution is so much more on target than saying, okay, well, what's wrong? Well, we got scheduling issues. We, the lesson plans, you know, you want me to do this and I have to do this. I just want to do this. Well, if, if you could just pause and really look at the middle part of the story, you come back with a lot more of the, um, a better understanding of the whys. So that's really how we, we, we talk about with design thinking. And now the whole idea of... Um, like the mindset. What we try with design thinking is we try to not so much change the way a person does something, but maybe hopefully add to the way the person does something instead of, um, again, just as I said, instead of jumping right to the conclusion, let's sit for it, let's marinate it with it, and, and let's be open-minded, and let's try things. Don't be afraid to fail. We have a, a phrase at uh, Mount Vernon that we use with failing up. Yeah. With design thinking, you don't you don't sit back and look at all the facts and figures and get all the data and, and really like get the rulers out and measure all those things just so that you can um, make sure that the, you're finding your answers right. You jump into your answer right. You jump into like trying to solve it with your prototyping. You, you're not afraid to put things down on paper. You're not afraid to put pipe cleaners together and see what someone likes or if it, if it works. Um, when you come into the um, school, we do have an eye design space that will, that typically will, our students will be either um, ideating, you know, doing an empathy map, but it doesn't have to happen in a, in a, in a siloed location. It can, design thinking can happen anywhere. It can happen on a park bench. It can happen at the lunchroom table. Um, typically with the, the kids, the two most important parts to design thinking for them is the empathy. That's the need finding, the interview the talking to others and trying to collect their stories and experiences and then of course the number two thing is the building the trying to prototype their their solution to the problem that they've identified um, I will give a quick story um, our, our second graders are currently in an ocean design thinking challenge and there we, we follow this model called um, deep discover empathize experiment and produce and we 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 designed this model of um, des this design thinking process. We based it off of Stanford's D School, and and everyone has different ways of 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 following this, of following a design thinking process. Um, I know the the, um, the Columbia School in New York, their their design thinking process has like nine modes. Um, the um, Henry Ford, they have a different model, and our model is deep and. For our second graders, when they did this ocean challenge, or currently in the ocean challenge, their discovery point, and the reason why discovery is so important and why we thought, instead of jumping right into empathy, which the D-School model does, our students aren't, they don't know everything like adults do, because, you know, adults know everything. They, their information is somewhat narrow, and research and um, observation is very important and so for example when we gave them the ocean because that was what they were studying they used the Great Pacific Ocean Patch as their as their their starting point the environment of the ocean and this particular location in the ocean of all this trash it's, it seems to find itself in this little um, patch well it's not that little but it's because of the currents so our students were aware of that and then from there they they learned a little bit more about the oceans like you know where are the oceans what are the oceans what makes something an ocean and then from there they've moved into the empathy and so they have been assigned different people to interview and they recently were interviewing um, assistant manager of Georgia Aquarium and his topic that he was talking about that he was passionate about was overfishing now, that was something that the teachers hadn't even brought up but through this interview, the kids were able to become aware of some important um, piece of the puzzle and now are able to solve, uh, um, try to solve it. And then one more other piece, and I will stop talking at this point. Um, I, I can go on and on. Um, this is a two-hour show tonight. <laughs> I know. <laughs> is our, one of our groups, our second graders interviewed our, one of our teachers who had spent four years in Nicaragua, and she 
was five minutes away from the beach. So she was telling stories, and you have these four kids. And I, I swear, I wish I had, I had, I had videotaped it because in the last four years of all the interviews I've ever experienced or witnessed, these second graders got it so much. They were so engaged, and they were so thoughtful for, for, with their questionings. But it wasn't like, okay, I have a question. Okay, do, why, why, why is this? Or where do you have this? They were listening to this this lady give her stories about sea turtle eggs being stolen. She was giving the story about this perfect spot in, in, in that's not, not polluted. And then she gave a story about a, the beach that's completely polluted because they just throw the trash in the river. So they were given all these different areas of problems that affected this teacher. And the way that they were able to take it in and record their information, I, I'm, I just am I'm almost giddy about what it's going to look like for when they try to um, do the empathy map and they tackle the prototyping of solving one of these problems that they've identified through just talking and um, need finding. Um, you can. I'll stop, and if you guys want to narrow, <laughs> or focus me in on some stuff. I will. I will try to do that. Okay. Very deep. I just have to say, very deep. Yes. <laughs> oh, I see the pun there. <laughs> well, I guess uh, Mary, for your second grade students, do they do it as an entire class, or are they? If they working in smaller groups. So that uh, I'll try. To, that's a great question. So the way we started this whole thing four years ago is, we found this concept. We had spring break. We jumped in with a whole um, fourth grade homeroom, and that was the very first design thinking challenge we had at Mount Vernon was to redesign the 21st century classroom, and that is now our current iDesign lab. So they actually went through the whole process, and they used the D schools model during this time to go through this challenge, and then we. And they presented their ideas to Dr. Jacobson, and we took their big prototype that they had created, and we're like, we've got to put this into real life. And so we built the iDesign lab. By that experience, we realized to meet our students' needs as well as let kindergartners, first graders, and whatnot to be able to experience design thinking, we needed to develop deep, which, again, we did. So the, the, the second year in, we went straight through K through six students, and each homeroom experienced different challenges. And some homerooms um, experienced multiple challenges that second year. The same thing last year. We did K through 6 again. And again, as I said, we're doing a, a trickle-up effect, starting with the younger kids. And so our current 7th graders are our original um, design thinking students. And now we have TJ Edwards, we have Trey Bowden, um, James Campbell, who have, they have gone to Stanford D School last summer, and they are now at the upper school. And so they're in a position to meet us in the middle. And next year will be even a greater a greater exposure with design thinking and infusing it and enriching it and, and spreading it throughout our, our two campuses. Some homerooms will do more than one design thinking challenge with me during the year. Um, and some grades, like for example, third grade currently is doing a Rube Goldberg design thing, design challenge that goes along with their science. That's one whole grade doing it. But this particular second grade is doing oceans. Sec another second grade homeroom in November did a um, design thinking challenge on redesigning the travel experience for pilgrims on the Mayflower. And it's pilgrim kids, so there was a little bit of more identification. And then the other second grade homeroom, they did a design thinking challenge on the Mars um, landers um, that were sending the rovers up to Mars. So it really depends on the grade, it depends on the homeroom, it also depends on the time. Um, we um, are also again modeling this approach the way Kim Sachs does it at Nueva. She doesn't have this this set schedule. She works with teachers and she's she does this her position on that is full time. So she works with teachers maybe oh, depending on the challenge a, a solid week at a time. Where right now we've had to piecemeal a little bit on our schedules because I, I have a I have another schedule of science lab, and so sometimes we're able to um, get a challenge done in a week. Sometimes we can do a couple hour um, here, a couple hours there, um, and sometimes it does go a little longer. What's also great is that this year our teachers have really taken a lot more ownership in design thinking and have pulled it into their classroom. Now they might not do an entire complete challenge from deep to produce, but they've pulled in the methods. Because you have these modes you have discover, and underneath discover is these modes that you can implement and empathize. You can do the need finding. You can do the empathy mapping. Experiment is the brainstorming, the ideation. So you have the modes and then you have the, um, the need finding. And I might be able to pull up something that sort of 
gives you a better visual on that. So that would be awesome. Okay, so you guys keep you ask me another question. I'll <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, well, while you're doing that, we have a quick shout out um, <clears throat> on our Google Plus page. We've got a comment from someone named Bonnie Jeanson, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. I hope so, Bonnie. Uh, she also attended the Stanford D School, which I'm going to ask you about shortly. And she is an online teacher um, at a public school in British Columbia. Oh, and wow. she also hey, said Bonnie. that she's a fan of uh, she's a fan of badging. So I was like, oh, hi. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so it's nice to have another um, somebody else who does design thinking uh, very very far away from where we're located. So hi, Bonnie. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, uh, we talked offline about this idea that design thinking. You know, it. I mean, Atlanta, it's it's it's. It's going like gangbusters, mm -hmm. and um, we'll talk uh, hopefully with some time um, before it's over. I mean, Mount Vernon's doing another um, design thinking experience. We this year, last year it was Design Thinking Summit. It was a one day experience, and this year it's a two day um, with a, a collaboration with Greg Bamford and Ryan Burke from Leading Is Learning out in Seattle. So it is a um, a West Coast East Coast collab um, called Fuse. But it happens to be that there are pockets of design thinking in the Northeast with the Riverdale School up in, um, also up in Michigan with Henry Ford. You have Mount Vernon covering the Southeast. And out in California, there's a lot of different pockets of um, not only charter schools, you have the Nueva, which I referenced, um, Los Altos District, which um, I will somehow tweet, but there's three ladies from Los Altos. Um, Alyssa Gallagher, she's the superintendent of curriculum for Los Altos. Um, Tammy, who I went with the D school with, and then also Ellen. They are they work behind the scenes in their district, and they are they are bringing not only design thinking makers movement um, throughout their whole district, and they're using professional development wise. So there are schools and and districts that are using design thinking. Some are not as socially media um, heavy as Mount Vernon might be. But they are there, and it is spreading, and that's that's a good thing. I found, I sound like Martha Moore. Martha, I'm Stewart. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see. Um, and actually, while you're still working on, uh, have you found the image yet? Not yet. Working? All right. Well, then go ahead and talk to us really quick about the Stanford D School. I know that didn't T J Edwards also go and James Campbell with you? Or yes. T J. Okay. So um, we were able to um, last year James Campbell and TJ were um, were selected as participants mm -hmm. and so they got to go and then the year we, and I went as a coach this past summer and then mm -hmm. two years ago I got selected as a participant and it and the thing is um, Susie um, I think Susie Wise she's now the director of the, um, the D school and, and there's Molly and Adam Royalty and um, they, they're a close-knit bunch, and they, they really do an amazing job at D-School with their resources in terms of sharing and, and letting others um, come to D-School. But their teacher workshop, which unfortunately they're not doing this summer, is, is phenomenal. And it's three days. It's free. It's, it's top-notch. And it, it's a great way to experience design thinking. It's, it's very full. And um, again, as fortunately, um, unfortunately, they're not having it this summer, but fortunately, Mount Vernon's having few, so it's almost right. like the same thing, if not better, because now we have Greg Bamford and Leading is Learning. But the experience was that we went there, and we, we got to experience design thinking. We went through a couple of challenges. One was the, um, and this is maybe this would help approach, help you guys understand a little bit more about how this gets implemented. The topic was campus safety. And we were given a booklet, their, their challenge booklet, and we were told the topic was campus safety. Go. And we had to go and interview people on the campus about campus safety. We didn't know where it was going to take us. We didn't know what was going to happen. But what was so great about design thinking, and I, I sometimes will um, compare it to project-based learning. Project-based learning is very teacher-oriented. It's very teacher-focused. They know where you're going to be, A, B, C, D, all the way to the Z. The outcome is, is completely predicted, and it's very teacher, so much behind the scenes before it's even delivered to the student. Design thinking, on the other hand, the structure sort of is in place, such as DEEP. But what's so great about it is the, the topic or the problem that, that you can tackle can happen from a conversation. It can happen by opening the newspaper, a local story. And it could happen for a global event, a, a natural disaster. But it doesn't have to be some kind of bad thing. And then you just you go with it. 
And so the kids will be put in, you know, we know what we're doing empathy right now, so that's where we are. We know we're doing prototyping, so that's where we are. But what they're doing in these modes, it's student-directed, it's student-driven. Um, so again, with the campus safety, we went out and we, we talked to students about their campus safety. Well, they're at Stanford. They didn't have any campus safety issues. They were like, we don't have anything. Everything's great. Well, it turned out their issue was bike riders. Their bikes, there are so many, and it's a very popular um, activity at Stanford, and, and they're known as one of the highest bike biking colleges. Well, it turns out the bicyclers and the walkers don't get along because the bicyclers don't follow the rules. So the walkers are walking, and they're always, like, spinning. You think about those cartoons and the people with the bikes, and they're, they're running into each other, and they're like, well, we have these stop signs, we have these bike paths, but they don't follow it. So we got to interview these people and find this stuff out, and then we had to come back together and try to, you know, understand, okay? And so our solution ended up being a bike walking festival to bring them together as a community and show how they can coexist, blah, blah, blah. So that was really how it went. So we, we did the interviewing. We did the empathy mapping. We did our how might we. How might we create an environment where the bicyclers and the walkers can find harmony with each other, yet still maintain a... I'm a biker attitude and I'm a walker kind of thing. Then we built it, then we got to role play, we got to then present it to and test it to our users, and then we then that was it. And that's really what you do. I, so, okay, I'll stop. <laughs> passion's good. No, yeah, exactly. It is, it is yeah. passion. It is, design thinking is very much passion based. Mm hmm. Very well, much. I think I think the next question that I kind of have to lead in is, you know, I sit here with my independent school friends. Um, Stacia has a little bit of a different background. Stacia's apparently done a little bit of everything as we're starting to learn about <laughs> Stacia. But, um, you know, I've done nothing but public school my entire life. I have worked in public schools, you know, I pros, cons, of course, but um, t my experience lies in public schools. So, you know, I see this vision of design thinking just catching wave in in the independent school mindset and the independent school thinking mindset. But how, where do you see design thinking fitting in in public schools today? Because obviously public schools and independent schools face largely different situations. Um, mm -hmm. Huge, huge, huge differences. Um, so where do you really see this design thinking um, fitting in? Because it, Honestly, as you stated, there's quite the difference between design thinking and project-based learning. And you know that in public education right now, project-based learning is huge. Mm -hmm. Right. So where does design thinking fit in public education? I think it, I mean, it, it fits in, in pockets for people who are willing to take the risk to try something that's sort of unpredictable. Um, you know, there's not a lot of data behind it. And then they're like, you know, how do you grade it? How do you grade it? You know, the, the schools that are going skills-based, they're, you know, their benchmarks. That's where you can you can you can show that design thinking is a perfect match. Um, our lower school, for example, is is we're have leaned to the skills, and the demonstrations that design thinking produced by students will show the communication, will show the critical thinking, um, the problem solving. With public school, especially, I think that um, there are so many situations and so many human needs that maybe, I mean, there, everyone has a human need. I mean, we all have human needs. We have way more wants, but our basic needs are to be listened to, to um, be cared for, to be loved, to have time with others. And in the public school, um, maybe it's a stereotype, but I think there are a lot of public schools out there that there are students there that need that more than ever. Mm -hmm. And for design thinking to be implemented into it in that concept of empathy, to be able to understand what your neighbor is going through, your classmate, to actually pause. I mean, if you think as a teacher today and you go back and you reflect on what you, you did, how many students did you actually stop and say, hey, how are you? What's going on? We have time that is such a factor to, that, in, that impacts that. But with design thinking, it helps us slow it down. We really can develop m meaningful relationships through this, 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 this mindset, through this methodology. And it's not all touchy-feely, even though it does sound like that. Um, <laughs> the actual output on the, the product. Um, Dr. Jacobson is really good about the idea that society and, you know, schools, you know, we, we're such consumers. And 
we need to be producers, we need to create, we need to make, we need to connect, and through design thinking, their solution is some product that came through feelings and it came through understanding someone else. And so I think the public school is ripe for the picking. I know with the whole, you know, the was it the core? What are we, the mm -hmm. common core? Common core. And, common core. Oh. What yeah. is it? The core. You can yeah. tell she's independent, right? Yeah. <laughs> what is that? Well, that core well, I, will, I, I will say that I, I, I was lucky enough to be um, on our science R&D team. I'm, I am on the science R&D team. D team and a couple of weeks ago the um, next gen science standards got got publicized and when we were going through all the different skills and and the units and the topics and stuff I was like oh that's a design thinking possibility that's a design thinking possibility and I will say and I was talking about this and I'm still formulating this con this idea um, so we've been doing design thinking for the last four years at Mount Vernon and we still have so much more to grow with this but I think design thinking is just one of our methodologies that we can reach our kids and, 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 mm -hmm. and really grow. Our lower school is really good with um, Project Zero's visible thinking. And visible thinking is thinking about thinking, but it's also pulling the thoughts out of our students' heads in different ways, such as, why did you say that? Well, what makes you say that? And these types of questions and the see, think, wonders. Well, design thinking and visible thinking, again, we, this thinking word, really are very good um, and then step with each other and can be utilized and cross match together. But then the third component to this, this thought that I have and I've been working on is the maker movement. The maker movement, um, someone said, well, that's not really a methodology. I was like, well, I think it's an underdeveloped methodology. I think the maker movement, if you look at all the different skills that a student has to do to construct and to make and to, to horn in on their, you know, they develop grit by the maker movement. Those who are making things and they have to keep trying and keep trying mm -hmm. and get it perfected. If someone was able to sit there with a notepad or a, I don't know, a, a rubric or some kind of data thing and data mine, all the things that these kids are connecting with, you'll see that there, there is connections with these three, three methodologies in so many ways. And again, I'm not a data person. So I know that there's someone out there who can data this stuff and say, okay, yeah, I can see where this is learning and I can see where this plugs in and I can see where this connects in. But you get that, um, was it the Bloom's taxonomy thing from the bottom? It's all concrete and that's what these standard-based tests are all about. It's like, you know, you, you, you know your facts and figures, okay, good, you know. But with design thinking, maker movement, visible thinking, we're going deeper. Yeah. Again, pun on the word. Deep. <laughs> Deep. Yes. It's not surface. Again, going back to these interviews I've been seeing with my second graders, they're listening to these adults talk about life events and human needs and human elements, and they're able to come back and say, wait a minute, why, why is the government doing that? Or, and I'm not getting polit political. Or why do the people throw trash in the river? Well, because they don't, that's just the way they do it. But, but why not put in a trash can? And then they connect with that. Well, that's, they don't have trash cans. Well, why not? Well, the money. And it's all economic. It's, so again, big answer, public school, design thinking are perfect to each other. It's just people have to be willing to take that step and leap of faith that not everything has to be fit into a box. In design thinking, you got to flare out and then focus in and then flare out and the things that you come up with will be amazing. And your students, again, Okay, I'm stopping. Well, look, I think I'm going to get a little <laughs> political here because uh -oh. as you were saying that, and I, and I see the passion there, and as a mother of a, you know, of a student in public school, I think it would be great if you had a design thinking challenge with the Board of Ed. No. No, no. See, so the thing about it is you can do design thinking challenges with almost anything. I mean, you can I get know, a strong I know, exactly, kind of but I don't think they... I'm sorry, but you know I don't know if the empathy is there. Like you know, they see the dollars and the cents and everything that has to get done. You know, you keep hearing about these furlough days and everything mm -hmm. else. But when you talk about you know just having them sit and and think about how they can solve these problems and go out there and talk to the people and see what's going on. Talk to the parents. Talk to the teachers. Talk to the principals. I mean, the there's so many design challenges that are awesome out there, and I think it's great because it does start with the leadership that, you know, Dr. Jacobson brought it to um, Mount Vernon. So, I mean, I think it's, it, it has to start from the top. And when they see the value there, and again, realizing how important it is that everything is focused on the student, on the mm -hmm. learner, mm -hmm. um, uh, they'll uh, get it. 
I will say, I mean, in my experience with that Mount Vernon being six years, and we have two different heads of schools there since I've been there, when it is trickle up and that's all it is, nothing, it, it's just spinning your wheels. Yep. And, um, but I, I, I really think that as long as, if we could do that meeting in the middle, and for Mount Vernon, we've had such a trickle down. I mean, right. you, you, talk the, you talk the walk, you walk the talk. <laughs> And that's what's happening. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So now, is that now a part of teachers' evaluations? Like, do they have to do a design thinking challenge? And how was that received? <laughs> All right. Well, so, so as I said, <laughs> when we first introduced this, we went straight to the students. And we have, a, um, you know, Riverdale up in New York, and they work with IDEO and, and another design firm. When they implemented their design thinking, they went to the teachers. And they pulled the teachers out, and they worked with them and worked with them. And then they came back to the school, and then they worked behind the scenes with other teachers on, you know, lesson plan issues or, you know, um, professional development stuff. We heard about design thinking during spring break, you know, studied about it, learned about it, and then went right into the hands of the students. The first year, again, same thing, student. The teachers came in and manned the hot glue guns, and hopefully they learned through osmosis. That was the hope. The third year, same thing. Well, this year, with our kids, really you know moving from concrete to abstract challenges and concepts and, and the idea of, 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 of these mindsets we re and again empathizing with teachers I realized teachers like to hold something in their hands they like to actually have a piece of paper that somewhat gives them some direction I don't need that and I I just go off and just go this way and that way well, so with empathy I had to understand that teachers want something so we were able to um, develop um, and this and I I developed this with a, with another um, design thinking colleague. I took her model and she let me utilize some of her concepts. I'm um, Co Barry up in um, Colorado Academy, and we created this thing called um, Deep Teaching Strategies. So, had strategies to implement deep into your um, into um, your challenge into your curriculum, and then we also did a lesson plan mapping. So, if you have a current lesson or a unit, how can you implement deep? Or if you want to start from scratch, how can you go through that? So that was helpful. And then we did professional. We've been doing professional development all through the school year with our teachers. And um, the bi the big kickoff was this thing called I four seven one, and that was all about redesigning our K our pre K through six learning spaces. And so we're currently um, when school ends at what on May twenty something, like the next day. The architects, the engineers, the you know the bulldozers—they're all coming in to gut um, one of our floors to create these learning um, communities for our kindergarten. So we're going in stages, and so we have created these this learning community, and it's all based on our teachers' needs as as a teacher, as a as a learner, and and they create they had interviewed different teachers to build and to 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 design this space, and then the following week we went to our students and they designed their learning space so all that stuff put together these architects architects came up with this idea of learning communities with learning learning commons so we're going to um, so a quick idea of how this looks is you go down the hallway and there's these open spaces barnyard barn doors that slide open in between the classrooms so it's not the open model of the 1970s open labs but it's a, where there's collaborative spacing, and then there's also time for individual homeroom, homeroom work. And then, um, so this this model that they've de designed will be um, implemented throughout the K through six um, classrooms. All of this was done through our our teachers and our students, and that was their first true experience besides the design thinking summit that they had experienced in the spring. And they went through it. So now that they've been able to go through the design thinking experience. They're such in a better position to teach it because I will say that when I first learned about this, I had never done a design thinking experience until a year and a half. I was teaching it and I'd never done it. It wasn't until I went to D school, and then when I went to D school, I was like, "Oh, I'm I now I know a little bit more. I have a better understanding of what that means and the pacing and all that." Mm -hmm. um, so our teachers are are they were fine with it. it wasn't It's not in an evaluation where I and again. We're pretty good in the sense, I guess, versus public schools, maybe, and maybe other private schools, that we don't have this checklist that we have to right. do this mm -hmm. and this. They're very, we're very um, open door, very collaborative, very fast-paced 
environment and we are, you know, we demonstrate our, our teaching, our learning, our instruction through our students and, you know, I think that it's very, a, a very hands-on approach. Our, our, my head of, my, head of um, my principal, Shelly Clifford, she's in our classrooms all the time. So in terms of evaluation and stuff, there's a lot of feedback, verbal feedback, mm -hmm. and one-on-one -on -one discussion. But in terms of, well, how did the teachers take it when they were required? Well, there's no requirements. We're inspired. We're encouraged. Okay. We are, um, we, we, it, it's, it's contagious. And there's, again, it, and this is a year of collaboration, so a lot of stuff has occurred in terms of spreading the wealth and spreading our talents among each other. So not saying that that won't happen, not saying that, like, on the report card, there's not going to be a, an assessment piece or whatnot on design thinking, but right now mm. that's not where we are. And that's awesome. fine. I think it's fine. We're, and we're in growing stages, and we're moving and grooving, and it's fun. And we drink a lot of Gatorade. <laughs> <laughs> well, you'll yeah. notice all three of us smiled at the same time, and I think we were all thinking the same thing, which is Mary Cantwell is the most passionate guest we've ever <laughs> had on Edge of You, hands down. Oh. But not only that, it's just nice to know that other teachers are inspired, um, because so many times you hear of teachers who are just tired, you know, and you're like, oh my God, which it's one more thing. Right, we are tired, don't get us wrong, yeah. but, you know, it's that passion that makes us keep going and, mm -hmm. you know. So, hey, real quick shout out to Kathy Shields. She's holding us. Oh, she's on awesome, Twitter. Kathy. I hope you go to Fuse. <laughs> Kathy is awesome. I but met I, her at I met her at Teach Meet Georgia a couple of years ago. Oh man, she's a great third grade teacher. Uh, great third. website. Awesome. All these elementary school teachers. But speaking of, as an upper school teacher at Mount Vernon, and this is my first year at Mount Vernon. As there, as edgy view watchers know background in public education, so I come to this school, and next thing I know is design thinking, design thinking, design thinking. And I know the lower school is really strong in it, and the upper school is really learning, because it's a very different monster. Yeah, <laughs> you and you guys tackle. are tackling something really cool, though. Yeah. And you're, you, I mean, as much as, I mean, again, lower school has, has led the way a little bit, and we're really big into tw Twitter and social media. You guys are tackling a, a wonderful thing, the um, transdisciplinary um, themes. Mm-hmm. Yes, guys, definitely, I mean, yes. <laughs> so when, it, that, when that's pulled together, I mean, just watch out. Oh, I know. It's going to be, it's, it's really amazing. I'm, I'm, it, I'm looking at education in an entirely different way, just from this one year of being a, a, a exposed to all these new concepts. Mm -hmm. And I really appreciate it. And, you know, I'm very lucky because literally on my right is TJ and on my left is James. So I'm surrounded mm -hmm. by design yeah. thinking. Um, and I, I wish that they they were be, be able to be here. So, and you, you can speak more about what TJ is doing. But uh, Stacy, uh, Stacey, you actually asked about um, whether we're evaluated. We're not really. I mean, we're not really evaluated, but we have collected some information from the upper school. Um, they wanted to know, you know, if we did any design thinking, or even if we experimented with it, um, and if we could list it. And I'm I'm telling you, I'm looking at this document and that we we put everything down. It's incredible how many people actually put their feet in the yep. water. And mm -hmm. even from like one of our PE teachers to yep. art to health, and I'm looking at it's amazing English, and I I, I actually dabbled too. So yeah. it I mean it, we are we are really trying to make the leap. And um, I know she keeps on Mary, you keep on talking about Dr. Jacobson. I want to point out really quick. I'm going to do a screen share so you guys can see what she's talking about. How the leadership has really bought into this as well, which is so important. Uh, not bought bought into it. He's, oh no, he established. He, yeah, he is. <laughs> he 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 he, he you know, threw buckets of water on us. <laughs> so now, Mary, did he come did. to you directly, or was this something you were also thinking about at the same time? Oh no, we had a we had a sit down in my science lab. I my science lab was crazy that day, and he sat down with me, and he's like in his suit and tie, and I'm like. Ah. And he's like, what do you, th I want to, I just came back from NIS, and this is what happened, and this is what I heard, and he heard about this, um, this, this, this story about the incubator, and how these students from Stanford had gone to um, India, and instead of talking to the doctors and the politicians and the government, they went and talked to these mothers, and I won't go into the story because it is long, but he was so moved by that one story, and he came back, he's like, just, we just check it out, I think your learning style and your, your teaching style might match this. And then we came back for his pre-break, and he said just to look at it. But when he says those things, it's our green light to jump in. Mm -hmm. And we, we jumped in. 
Oh, his design, yes. Oh, I'm telling you, his blog is amazing, y'all. It is drbreadjacobson.com, and he is, if you, if you want resources, I'm going to show you three of them. But this is, our, this is our leadership, and it really, again, you have to have leadership who is in this as well in order for it to really function. Um, but he also has a podcast they're producing at Mount Vernon. You can get information about Fuse, um, which, you know, I hope you share some before you, before you yeah. leave, Mary. But uh, anything you want to learn about design thinking and, you know, the maker movement, you can really find from his blog. So I highly recommend that. But uh, Dr. Jacobs is wonderful. Also, um, I do keep on mentioning TJ. Uh, TJ is, you know, an upper mm -hmm. school science teacher. So those of you who are actual teacher teachers, you, you can also see exactly what he's talking about and that it's very, very doable in your classroom. You don't have to have, I mean, if you're a public school teacher watching this right now and you're like, oh, I, nobody's ever done this in my school, you can still do this. And you mm -hmm. know, he has done it just in his classroom, and he does blog about it, so you can get that information. And finally, Mary, there's a, there's your, and I love that little graphic at the top. Yay. So I think that yes. really helps explain Deep, but you can also see some of the things that she's doing, deepdesignthinking.com. So, um, yeah, it, there's a, a lot of great resources available for people who want to learn more and figure out how exactly this can apply to your classroom, to your school, even to your district, if you want to be that brave. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, hey, Kat, awesome. could you get a couple more tabs open? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> this I'm is glad nothing. you can't see mine, then. <laughs> <laughs> what you don't see is the fact that I have three other browsers, Chrome browsers, right. open at the same time, too. So there you go. Oh, goodness. <laughs> well, listen, I did attend the um, summit you guys had, and I thought it was great. One of the things that I took away from it was that um, you guys had people there from the business community, from the entertainment community, talking about mm -hmm. how they were using design thinking. So it's great to know, you know, that this isn't just something they're going to get in school and that's it. You know, they're going to take this beyond um, their, you know, education. Yeah. Oh, definitely. I mean, we're... You know, our mission, I think, is, is, is pretty much what we're doing. I mean, inquiry, innovation, impact, you know, globally. Um, oh, no. Cat, oh, no. <laughs> no. Uh, it's globally. Uh, globally. And leaders. Oh, yeah, glo that's, yes. I think that's the key. And <laughs> that's what design thinking is, is helping mm -hmm. is, is we're, we're getting out of our, our, our tunnel and we're breaking down the walls. And um, even next year's. Um, design thinking challenges because again we'll be moving from concrete to abstract um, challenges. The goal for next week's cha next year's challenges for all K through um, K through four students at least are to be locally based. Meaning we had our first grade this year um, redesign bus stops down the street from us, and our goal for next year is that our kids are going to connect with our local neighbors in Sandy Springs and see where they can find impact and, and empathize and, and, and create. And by the way, what you see at the very top of her, of the, of the Fuse page right there, the little uh, rainbow symbols, those are the mindsets mm -hmm. that Mount Vernon has adopted. And those are definitely embedded within design thinking. Oh, yeah. You, you I mean, talk about like standards-based grading that could possibly happen with this, which I know TJ is doing as well. So, so mm -hmm. many things that you can incorporate. It's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> So I did want to, I wanted to share, I think I mentioned the placemat, um, or, so we have our deep, and these are our modes, but underneath them are the methods, different things that our teachers are able to um, utilize in terms of where they are in the mode, like experiment, they can do the how might we, if you ever start a question with what, you sort of get blank faces, but if you started a question with a how might we, all of a sudden it opens up possibilities. And then the brainstorming, same thing. You give them a piece of paper, it's blank, or they've maybe put two or three things down. But you put them next to people, you put them on a whiteboard, and you say, throw up on that whiteboard. Just whatever comes to your head, it's amazing. And then, of course, the prototyping. And same thing with the produce is the final thing. It's the show, don't tell. Right now I'm doing a lot of telling. But showing is really giving your creation or your solution to your user and seeing what happens, receiving feedback, iterating. Storytelling is really key in design thinking, I think, when you finally get to your final piece, is to be able to tell the story of how this, this solution came to, be, came, came to be. I love that image. Awesome. I know. It's so cute. Well, it's very thorough, and it's very simple, and mm -hmm. it really and our, makes sense. Yeah. And our students, they'll, they'll go through, you know, through the challenge booklet, you know, here's our, this is the empathy mapping. 
you know, your point of view. Uh, I think this was our interview thing that our kids did when they're, when they're interviewing for the ocean and collecting stories. And I think the key to this whole thing is the collecting of stories. So that's that. I'll get off that. Awesome. Thanks for sharing. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to give a little shout out because at Love It, um, two of our middle school teachers, Todd Wass and Ben Poston, have revamped the global studies curriculum um, into one that's totally designed thinking. So they've introduced the year just by doing many challenges. Mm -hmm. But by the end of the year, they actually have studied, they've researched, they've interviewed mm -hmm. um, people who work with, you know, different issues that are going on in developing countries. And they come up with these prototypes and then they present to the group, like to the audience, like a TED Talk on all of their research and their findings and they show these prototypes and you're just amazed like mm -hmm. I definitely see future entrepreneurs in our midst with some of the things that they've come up with um, so it's really an exciting um, time for those students mm -hmm. too. Well Sassy, like the whole idea when you guys did the cell towers with the 3D printer mm -hmm. you, got, you guys have the 3D printer and, and um, we I think we're going to be getting some maker bots um, for the fall. S schools that have this this 3D printer, the fabrication, even the makers, a maker's lab and stuff, those things are invaluable when you, when you do a design thinking challenge. And then even with your cell towers, could you tell a little bit about how that, you know, what was that? Well, they didn't do it was, this year. Yeah, I wasn't no. there when they did it, but the sixth grade math class, because um, the reception on Love It is horrible. <laughs> you get someplace and you're like, I can't use Use my phone. Um, but anyway, the sixth graders uh, did it as a part of their math class where they used the uh, Fab Lab model maker software. Mm -hmm. And we have the silhouette printers where actually they print and cut, you like perforate the paper, and then you can model it into a 3D figure. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so they did that to, you know, they had a design challenge about creating towers. Where would it be? Where would, you know, how does it blend into the environment? Exactly. You know? Yes. And that kind of thing. You didn't want uh -huh. anything that was going to take away from the beauty of the campus. So it had to be practical and all these other things. So and so that's where the challenge is: is that that they gave they gave them that how might we, and then they had the math component. So you think about again going back to public school or just school in general. It looks like fun and games, and it's you're you know playing with po um, you know popsicle sticks and stuff. No, there are you can use this in your curriculum. The, the math again with the cell towers. Our middle school teacher redesigned the um, middle school um, module building. And they had to do all kinds of schematics and, and, and um, blueprints. So there are all these types of mathematical concepts they had to implement with it. Same thing with social studies or history. I mean, you're studying some major piece of um, history, and you stop it right at that moment. And then you go, how might we change the outcome of this thing? I mean, you, you could even go as far as the Holocaust. You could have um, gone with, um, oh, I know our physics teachers did the trebuchet. And the whole idea of why was the trebuchet brought into um, to into this this environment, and there's a lot of empathy pieces that go with that. But then there's also the academic part of the physics of a trebuchet that I don't understand, but they look really cool and and stuff. Well, hey, this has been amazing. A uh, cat? Do you want to? Yeah. yeah, really quick. I saw that you had a page up with Fuse. Can you give yes. us the link and the dates and how people can sign up and? Anything, any, anything interesting that you can share about Fuse? I would love to. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. I'd be in trouble if I didn't say anything. Well, <laughs> let's see. Starting. Is it sharing? I think it is. Okay. Yes, it is. So, as I said earlier, Fuse is a, um, a West Coast, East Coast yeah, collaboration yeah. with Greg Bamford and Ryan Burke from Leading is Learning and Mount Vernon Institute <laughs> for Innovation. And Mount Vernon Institute for Innovation is another offshoot of um, Mount Vernon. But with that, um, we're working together with these, with these two gentlemen, and we're bringing in design thinking and then this, this concept called the paradox of group life. So with design thinking, the empathy is creativity, collaboration, empathy. The collaboration piece is huge because you're, you're, you, you can't create and, and come with these kind of things without others. And so the dynamics of how a group works, and that we've all been, you know, collaborations happen all the time, and you sit in a group, and you, you have to identify where am I in this group, who am I? Am I the leader in this group? Am I the follower? Am I the wallflower? Am I the, you know, the negative Nelly? And through their work, they're going to help us work on this dynamic of group life and try to help us understand 
you have a task or you have you have something that you have to accomplish well how are you going to get through that in a healthy positive yet productive way and so one of the um, concepts is called task and maintenance um, when you're in a group or when you're doing work you have a lot of to-do list stuff and you have to keep going after this to-do list and sometimes you're struggling or you're, you're like you're drowning well sometimes what your bosses do is they add more to your to-do list or you add more because you think oh I gotta do this and I gotta do this you forget the side this concept called maintenance how are you maintaining yourself? How are you maintaining yourself within the group? And how's the group maintaining and mixing? So that's just one aspect to this experience. Um, again, we did the Design Thinking Summit. It was a one-day mad dash. It was TED Talks in the morning, a quick um, design thinking challenge. Well, we're going to slow it down a little, go two days. We have a little mixer um, on Monday night, and then we go into Tuesday and Wednesday on June 18th and 19th. And they will, um, we will encounter a design thinking challenge, which will be applicable for educators, but it will be applicable for many people because we don't have just educators coming when it involves with something with firsts, your first something. So that's sort of a, a teaser. And then throughout the design thinking challenge, we're going to infuse this concept of group life. Um, we have some good openers in the morning, but really this is all about the connections the collaborating and the creating of your groups and we have um, whereas the design thinking summit was we hoped for 50 all of a sudden we had 100 and then we had 140 and we kept adding more people um, and we had like two months to plan this we've had a little bit longer to plan this event um, we are limiting this to only 100 so you are a, it's a group of 100 people 100 fusers and, um, and that will create a, a more intimate a more hands-on, a more direct approach. We have some great, um, we have some great facilitators, and I think it's, it's okay. It's coming. <laughs> we have some great facilitators that are not only going to help us with the design thinking process, but they're from all over the country. Um, we have um, a girl named Jen from Toronto, and we also have we have TJ. We have Scott Sanchez, who's right next door to us down the street. At First Data, he's a big D school guy. He's always working with the MBA guys and and going through the design thinking boot camps. Jennifer Chen is the one from um, Exhibit Change from Toronto, and then oh Leonard Medlock, yeah, he's coming back Love for a second. Leonard, oh. and he's from Ed Surge, and I have to throw out Ed Surge because Ed Surge is what invited Mount Vernon, or who invited Mount Vernon to um, South by Southwest EDU this year and put us in the makerspace, and it has opened our eyes and again the connection of makers and design thinking and all that and so um, Leonard will be here and James um, and what's so cool I found out a couple of days ago Shelly um, Paul from Woodward their, Woodward is sending some of their students and Mount Vernon is sending some of their students as well and I hope that other schools will catch on this bandwagon we don't have many more spaces but we do still have some available and for to have these adults and students together in these teams I think will make a huge dynamic and we have people coming from Rhode Island Connecticut, um, Texas, Florida, Tennessee, Kentucky, and that's different than what it was last year. Last year was a huge southeast component, mainly Atlantans. It's it's a different demographic, and again, I think I, we. Are, I will say one more thing, and this is about Dr. Jacobson. Yesterday, me, Trey, Bowden, and TJ and Dr. Jacobson were in a room brainstorming, and we talk about you know, Stasia asked, well, when did did you learn about design thinking through something else or did Dr. Jacobson actually come and see you? Dr. Jacobson is in the thick of things and for our brainstorming session he was right there with his suits rolled up throwing out ideas of okay you know we get a band or we get a, we get um, <laughs> some cornholes and we you know he was the DJ and, and so he's all in it and the planning for our mixer last is, is, was so cool and to have him part of that and again he, as our leadership He's up there, but he's down with us, rolling up the sleeves along with us, and that's really great. Awesome. Well, this has been an exciting night. What about you guys? You think so? Oh yes, <laughs> oh, very much so. Very I mean, so. Like, I think we're gonna have to have you on here for a part two. I mean, you just had so <laughs> oh, much to so. share, like post views and you know, how the conference went. And and I love it. And uh, but I will. I have to give shout outs to some other Mount Vernon people. I mean, we're 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 a team and stuff like that. But Shelley Clifford. If you're yes. talking about, you wanted some um, some insight um, on so many things. Clifford, um, at Clifford Shelley is someone I would hit 
and, and try to get her on here. She, the things she has to share and the way she's approached her. Um, she, came, she came from fifth grade when she became our, our, our head of, of lower school. She's, and so in that, in that experience, in that, that approach of what Dr. Dixon did to select her has been wonderful for our school and our, our, our team, and she just has a lot. So I would, and again, all our, our heads are divisions, but again, administration, I'd go for Shelly Clifford if you could. And, and, and you know, Kat Flippin's here, so she, you get her off every time. <laughs> yeah, we get to take her in all of her wonderfulness. <laughs> and all my extreme geekiness. <laughs> we love it, though. Well, anyway, we're going to go ahead and start signing off. It's um, been great chatting with you, Mary. Thank you so much for agreeing to join us tonight. Oh, I've enjoyed it, and hopefully my face hasn't been too close. I've been, I've been watching myself, so I don't know well, how this is going to work. We've been doing birds chirping in that beautiful scenery you provided for us. <laughs> oh, great. That was great. great. Um, and to our listeners out there, our viewers, thank you so much for tuning in tonight. Um, you can also go to our YouTube channel and see past guests. And so we hope you have a great night. Good night. Oh, we ha wait, we have oh. a tease. Oh, oh, we have a tease. Oh, no. No, no, no. What's a tease? Jamie, you do the well, honors. You know, we're excited. You know, we've, we've been doing a lot to, like, you know, give advance warning of who our guests are. But, you know, that's just not any fun anymore. So now what we're going <laughs> to do is require you to follow our hashtag. So we're not going to tell you. All we're going to say Ooh. is that our next show is going to be May 23rd. And if you want to know who our guest is, you're going to have to follow the hashtag, participate, collaborate with us, ask some questions. Mm -hmm. In fact, maybe if someone asks, we might just tell. So follow that interview hashtag, <laughs> do some talking, you know, see if you can coax it out of us, and maybe you'll find out who our guest is on May 23rd. It's an amazing one. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. All right, ladies. Well, Mary, again, thank you so much. And uh, oh, Thank you, guys. Really appreciate it. It was fun. I love talking about this stuff. <laughs> we You'll be tell. back on, I promise. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Thanks, and good night.